class. Welcome to the final segment in Lecture 8. And in this final segment, we will continue exploring some of the physical consequences of the mass continuity equation that we spent so much time, energy, and math deriving. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right into it. So this is the equation that we left off with. Uh, partial rho, partial t, again, an Eulerian change in density, plus the divergence of the mass flux here. And if we want to, we can use the idea of this divergence operator, which is the del or gradient operator that we looked at in lecture one, dotted with our rho times our velocity vector. And if we want to, we can expand that, uh, expand this term out to get something that looks like this. So we get partial rho partial t plus partial with respect to x of density times zonal wind plus partial with respect to y of density times meridional wind plus partial with respect to z of density times vertical wind. That looks kind of not very fun to work with, and I definitely agree with that. So something that we like to do is assume that we have an incompressible fluid, which most atmospheric situations, this is a valid assumption, even though the atmosphere is a gas, and technically gases are compressible. So this does have to be used with a bit of a caveat. You do have to keep in mind that technically the atmosphere is not strictly an incompressible fluid, but to a good approximation, that does represent a lot of atmospheric, uh, a lot of atmospheric flow patterns. Of course, if you have a liquid which is also fully incompressible, then this equation also works well, or this uh, assumption also works well. But in the case of the atmosphere specifically, uh, it works pretty good to a, a good approximation, with the exception of a few specific situations. So just for the sake of simplicity, we'll go ahead and apply this assumption. And as, if the atmosphere is in fact incompressible, then that means the density is constant. The only way that you can change density is if you have a compressible atmosphere. The density of water cannot change, unless with some slight exceptions, like if you heat it up or cool it down, then sometimes you can change the density of water that way. But for the most part, density of water does not change. But, also, but the thing is, with a gas, you can compress it and expand it, and by doing that, you change density. But if we assume that we have an incompressible flow pattern, then we assume that density is constant. And that allows us to greatly simplify this equation down, believe it or not. First of which is, if density is constant, that means it doesn't depend on any variable, then that means this derivative of density with respect to time is equal to zero. So we can just completely forget about that term. And if density is also constant, that means that we can take this constant value and pull it out of the derivative operator so that we get rho times du dx plus rho times dv dy plus rho times dw dz, which will give us a result that looks like that. Again, we have this term that over here that goes to zero. And then here's where it becomes really simple. If You'll notice how we have a common factor of density in each one of these terms. If we divide through the equation by density, we get a result that looks like this. And this down here is in fact the incompressible form of the mass continuity equation, whereas this form up here at the top, that is the fully compressible form of the mass continuity equation. So let's take a closer look at this incompressible form of the mass continuity equation to substantiate some of the stuff we talked about in the previous lecture, which had to do with surface convergence, surface divergence, divergence aloft, and convergence aloft. This is gonna be where that mathematical substantiation comes into play. So if we continue on that idea, again, we can also abbreviate this as del dot v is equal to this entire thing. So we could say del dot v is equal to zero. That's just a simplification we can make if we really want to. So there's that simplification. But another th definition that you'll commonly see is the horizontal divergence, which is usually defined as this lowercase Greek delta that's equal to du dx plus dv dy. This is actually one of several horizontal kinematic definitions that we'll look at. We'll take a look at the other three in the next lecture, but for now, we'll focus on only this horizontal divergence term, which is delta. So this is looking at only, this is only looking at if there's horizontal, or if there's divergence acting in the horizontal plane, as if there's divergence acting in the x and the y directions, or the zonal and meridional directions. And by convention, by the way we've defined it, if this term delta is positive, that is, if we evaluate all these derivatives and we end up with a positive result, that means we've got a divergent flow pattern. That means the flow is moving away from a common point. And also, by the way, we define it, if we have delta is less than zero, that means we have convergence, which means all the flow is moving towards some common point. It's converging towards some, some common point. But also, it's entirely possible for this term to be zero. And if this horizontal divergence is zero, then we say we have a non-divergent flow pattern, meaning it's neither converging or diverging, which means uh, 
this if this entire term here is zero, then that means dw dz would also have to be zero. And sometimes this also applies to this del dot v term. So if del dot v is positive, that means you've also got a divergent flow pattern. If del dot v is negative, that means you've also got a convergent flow pattern. It's just here, del dot v takes into account x, y, and z directions, whereas this delta only takes into account the x and y directions, only looking at a horizontal plane. And if we take this expression for delta, du dx plus dv dy, we can replace this term on the left-hand side, du dx plus dv dy, we can replace that with this lowercase delta, so we get delta plus dw dz is equal to zero, or if we rearrange that, we get dw dz is equal to negative delta. And as we'll see later on using a more illustrative approach, if delta is negative, meaning we have convergence, that means this whole thing dw dz is positive, and if delta is positive, then we have a negative on the right-hand side here, which means this term dw dz is equal to negative. So let's take a look and see how this idea, using the incompressible form of the mass continuity equations, let's take a look and see how this idea can actually model the flow patterns in the atmosphere. So with that, we will go ahead and go into this. So again, these are the definitions that we have. And let's consider a flow pattern that looks like this. And we'll imagine that this is the ground. So again, the wind cannot go into the ground. If it's going to go anywhere in the vertical direction, it would have to go up or down. It would have to go up this way or down this way. And if we look at this flow pattern, we can see that as we go in the positive x direction, u becomes more positive. Here we're going to be ignoring the Murray-Allen component for the sake of simplicity. So here delta is just going to be equal to du dx. As we go in the x direction, as we go in the positive x direction, u is becoming, it's becoming more negative, sorry. I think I may have said positive earlier, it's becoming more negative. As I go in the positive x direction, u is becoming smaller, it is becoming more negative. And similarly, as I go into the negative x direction, u is becoming bigger, it's becoming more positive. So that means this term du dx must be negative because as I go in the x direction, the u is changing in a different direction and vice versa. So if I if going in one direction of x causes a different a change in the different direction for u, that means this du dx terms must be negative. So again, just to sort of reiterate that as u, u decreases as x increases and u increases as x decreases, so this means that du dx must be less than zero and must be negative. Which means that our divergence term here, our horizontal divergence delta, must be negative as well, which means we've got a convergent flow pattern. And just by looking at it, we can see we do in fact have a convergent flow pattern. All the wind is going towards a common point, which is this point right here. Which means that this dw dz term must be positive as well. So if I plug in a negative on the right hand side of this equation here, I get a positive on the right hand side of this equation, which means that dw dz must also be positive. Now this means, as I go in the positive z direction, that means w, the vertical wind, must be increasing. So as I go in the positive z direction, that means w must, become, must be getting more and more positive. It must be increasing. And if we assume that the vertical wind is zero at ground level, that means as I go to higher levels of z, that means w is going to point, is going to increase upward. So it's going to produce a flow pattern that looks like this. So as I go, again, as I go up in the z direction, w is going to increase, and this will in fact result in rising motion, which is something that we showed conceptually when we take a look at the gradient flow pattern, how, and also at uh, how friction causes surface convergence. And when you have surface convergence, we get rising motion. So this, again, is that mathematical substantiation of that concept that we introduced earlier. And if we turn things around, so now the flow pattern is pointing in the opposite direction. And just from a visual inspection, we can see that this is, in fact, a divergent flow pattern. because It's all moving away from a common point. And if we again look at this from a mathematical standpoint, as we go in the positive x direction, u is increasing. The zonal wind is increasing. And as I go in the negative x direction, u is decreasing. So since a change in one since a change in one variable causes a same change in the other variable, so as I go in the x direction, u also increases. So as, let me rephrase that. As I go in the positive x direction, u also increases. So as x increases, u increases. That therefore means that this derivative must be positive. If that derivative is positive, that means delta must also be positive, which means I have a negative on the right-hand side of this equation here. So that means dw dz must be negative.
So that means that as I go in the positive z direction, again, we're not going to worry about ground because we can basically assume the wind is to be zero there. As we go in the positive z direction, that means w must be decreasing. And if our wind is zero at ground level, as we go up in z, the term w becomes more and more negative as we go upward, which means we get a flow pattern that looks like this, and we get sinking motion. So you see, as I go up in the z direction, w decreases, meaning we have sinking motion. And again, that fits with the conceptual model that we introduced earlier. Now let's take a look at the upper level part of this. So here I'm going to be taking a look at the stratosphere, which here this uh, x-axis basically marks where the tropopause is. And to a good approximation, the wind doesn't go into the stratosphere. So it behaves a lot like the ground. It doesn't quite work that way. You can have wind that briefly goes into the stratosphere and then comes back down. But for our intents and purposes, and for the sake of simplicity, we'll just assume that the wind can't go into the stratosphere because it's just too stable of a layer in the atmosphere. But here we have a divergent flow pattern aloft. So you can see all the wind is blowing away from a common point here. And again, the same logic that we had before. As we go in the positive x direction, u increases. So that means that this du dx term must be positive. If this du dx term is positive, that means this delta, this horizontal divergence, is also positive, which means I have a negative on the right-hand side of this equation here. It means dw dz is negative. So that means that as we go in the, as we go in the positive z direction, that means uh, w must be decreasing. But if we go in the negative z direction, that means w must be increasing. And since the wind is approximately zero in the stratosphere, the only place we can go from here is down, down the z-axis. And make sure I'm really precise about that. We're only going down the z-axis. But as I go down in the z direction, that means w must be increasing. And if the wind is zero here, an increasing w as I go down in the z direction means I must have rising motion or flow pattern that looks like this. So again, as I go in the negative z direction, as z decreases, w increases. And again, that fits with the conceptual model that we defined in the previous lecture where divergence aloft does in fact lead to rising motion. Last case that we'll look at involves convergence aloft. So again, same logic as before. As we go in the positive x direction, u decreases. And as we go in the negative x direction, u increases. So that means that du dx must be negative. If the u dx is negative, then our horizontal divergence term is negative, which means dw dz must be positive. dw dz is positive. Remember, we can't go into the stratosphere, so we have to go down in the z direction. So if, z, if we go in the negative z direction, in order for this to be true, that means w must be getting more and more negative as well. And since the wind is zero here to begin with, as we go in the negative z direction, that means that w must be decreasing. That means we must have downward motion. And this, again, fits with the conceptual model that we came up with in the previous lecture, where if you have convergence aloft, you have sinking motion, and our mass continuity equation agrees with that assessment. So just to sort of summarize, if you have convergence at the surface, you must have rising motion. If you have divergence at the surface, you have sinking motion. Again, just sort of combining everything we learned from the previous lecture with the stuff that we derived mathematically in this lecture. And if you have convergence aloft, that gives you sinking motion. And if you have divergence aloft, that gives you rising motion. And also a couple of other points that are kind of important to keep in mind is some assumptions we like to make. We often assume that the vertical wind is zero at the surface, or where z is equal to zero. And we also like to assume that the vertical wind is approximately zero at the tropopause, or right as we get toward the stratosphere. Again, not always a truly representative assumption of what's going on in the, in the atmosphere, in the actual atmosphere, but usually it's good enough for us. And that's just a common theme in meteorology. If it's good enough for us, then it's good enough to uh, make our math a little bit simpler. So that's going to do it for this final segment. Hopefully everything, for the most part, made sense. And that's going to do it for this lecture. So in the next lecture, we'll talk about more, uh, we'll talk about this delta term in a little bit more detail and also introduce some other, what are referred to as kinematic flow patterns. But we'll save that for the next lecture. So I will see you all there.